<laughs> yeah, so just, to, just a little bit of the background, no, I'm clearly not from here. Um, I um, am actually a French person with an American accent, which is all good. <laughs> not Canadian. Um, and um, I actually come from a background, like you said, in uh, mapping. So I uh, did my Master's in Urban Planning at Columbia University and work at, worked at the um, Spatial Information Design Lab as a researcher. Uh, and that's a really cool and funky place where, at the time when I was there, which was a, a little while ago, um, <laughs> um, a lot of the ideas of visualizing the invisible were kind of coming to the fore and, you know, there was opportunities to start thinking about, you know, how might you visu visualize um, a cultural um, vibe or um, how might you visualize the density of different industries according to like Getty images that were geo-referenced. It was the beginning really of like geolocation and all that kind of stuff. So I worked with a very charming lady called uh, Sarah Williams up, up there and um, and that was all good fun and then when I graduated, because you always have to move on from these things, don't you? Um, unfortunately. And uh, I worked for UNICEF actually for a while, um, looking at the way in which we can apply technology to the developing context and um, part of the remit with UNICEF is obviously children. <clears throat> but um, in that there was um, the agenda around connecting classrooms which was very similar to what you showed here um, and, and that was an interesting project like any organization UNICEF comes with its inefficiencies um, but it also came with a, a world of possibility which was really interesting and then the other thing that UNICEF does which is interesting is that it's the logistical uh, organizer in case of an emergency and so there's a lot of innovation around the use of SMS in places um, and it sounds really archaic to us to think about SMSs but actually for most of the world SMS is a solution. Um, smartphones are, you know, the, 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 the um, what's the word? Um, I can't think of the word. Problem but solved. Yes, there you go. Of 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 only very few, no, very few countries that can that have the infrastructure to support it, and in many cases, SMS is much more viable. So um, we looked at ways in which you can use SMS to like enter database information about where food had been delivered or that kind of stuff, and it, it was a very cool and envi environment. And so from that, I ended up in Sydney and I ended up working with Dan Hill, who uh, I don't know. Not everybody knows who he is, but he basically founded this idea at Arab of urban informatics, and we owe him all the uh, respect we can give him um, for creating a market, really, in a space that was quite, quite small and quite tight in Australia, because we don't often um, trailblaze. Um, <clears throat> I'm really, I think this is a fantastic theme for today, and I'm going to pick up on some of the things that you've said. Um, and Siobhan has said as well. And I'm, only, I'm going to put up there just some ideas, and mainly what I'm interested in is that I, the way in which um, these ideas are mainly prototypes um, for, for things that we can all develop on. Um, and so I'll take you through some of, some of them. But first I'll explain really that the whole idea of what my team does is that we operate both at a strategy level and at a design level at the impacts of digital connectivity on the city. So what does it mean that we've got ubiquitous data? What does it mean that you've got permanent um, connection to the World Wide Web? And what does it change about the way in which you inhabit your cities? And just anecdotally, I mean, I'm noticing a real big shift in, in, in the way in which we talk about building our cities and my clients, and this is from local councils to like big developers and so on, are more and more speaking about the city as this platform and rather of committing and saying, oh, we want benches this way and that way, and a fountain in the middle, and we want some ducks and all this crap, you know. And saying, <laughs> <laughs> why don't we give ourselves the option, actually, to adapt that over time? And the, some of the ideas that you were talking about in the museum, this idea of being able to delve in and opt in to a certain experience, and another in, in, in opt out. And there's nobody more interested in the idea of, um, of you know, digitally enhancing life than me. But I think you're going to be a bit surprised about my, the conclusion I came to. And I discussed this with myself and my boyfriend yesterday. And, um, and, and you'll see. Anyway. <laughs> um, so I'm interested in the interdependency between the digital and the analog. And so in what ways... And I, I often get very cross at clients who say, like, I want screens. Just put screens everywhere. And like, no, no. That's, you, first of all, you need an AV consultant, not me, because I don't know anything about how, how you should hook up your screens. And the other thing is that the technology is only enabling. And I think I'll show through the examples that I've chosen, and most of them are not my work, um, but the examples that I've chosen that 
the, the, the solution to what you're trying to help generate may be a post-it. You know, technology mm -hmm. can be very, mm -hmm. you know, small and, well, seemingly insignificant. So, one of the first ideas that I put out there is this, um, I went to, I was recently in Paris, um, which is where I grew up, and um, I went to this, um, this big warehouse, well, no, it's not a warehouse, it used to be a um, morgue that they turned into a kind of creative space hubby thing. And they actually had a digital festival while I was there, and I was visiting this, and one of the guys that I was there with is a great tweeter called Emil Huge, who runs his own, uh, business in kind of this space of digital consulting and, and so on and so forth. And um, we went there, and he's telling me about this mob called Node A. And Node A are... They're, they kind of don't really cross the boundary of a consulting company, but they're definitely like a creative collective, and they created this concept called Museomix, which is which I'd love to bring to Australia, but I need a bit of strength behind me, so maybe one of you guys would be interested <laughs> in partnering. But the idea is that you go into a museum and you bring not like only post-its and, and you know markers and dots and all that crap, but really like you come in with like the whole works with like coders, you come in with a 3D printer, you come in with you know the, the real kind of prototyping outfit and you hack the museum. So they gave three days and they did the prototype in this place called um, Museum of Decorative Arts, and they used a certain room that was full of different chairs, um, and they sat there for three days, and they worked with the curators, and they worked with um, the people who do audience development and all that stuff, um, and really sat down for three days and came up with a number of ideas, you know, and they accelerated their path towards success or towards failure, and that's what design is all about, you know, it's just really learning from your mistakes in a fast, accelerated, and safe way, uh, risk managed, I should say. Which doesn't sound very designy, does it? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> anyway, so what I thought was really cool, and this is prototype, and this is what I really like about people who put stuff out that's not absolutely perfect, because I think there's so much to learn from from you know the rough copy off, off the back of your notebook. But so the idea here, you can see this screen, and what they're trying to what they're trying to create here, and this is the idea that kind of got legs in that the museum was interested in pursuing, was kind of a dashboard that would. So represent the social interactions that are happening around specific objects. And so you would be, it's a geo reference, a, like geolocated, it would be able to say that you're in this room, and then you could opt in and you could send messages about what you like about this particular chair or this you know, piece of art mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, and you know, it looks like this for now, but I think that what's really important is the software platform that sits behind it. But the idea is that the dots actually refer to an event and the lines refer to people. And so they're trying to develop this interface that um, would show you, it's called Kaleidomix thing, um, that would actually tell, enable you to interact in an indirect way with the people around you, so create social interaction. So that was a pretty cool idea. Um, I don't know if anybody, any of you have um, heard of that. Yeah, it's really cool. This is quite old as well. Um, it's a few years old, maybe three or four. Um, no? First iPad I've ever had. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, iPod, iPod, this, sorry, iPhone app. Mm. And so I think it initially started as, um, as an app to experience... Um, this, the, the, the past of the city, and so you could, it's an augmented reality app, and you have a, you know, there's this building, and it didn't used to be there, and here's what it used to look like. But I think since then, they've augmented it to actually imagine futures, which I think is pretty bloody cool. Um, I forget the name, I wrote it down, and I, I should attribute all this work to the people who did it. It's Irene something, and some other guy, I can't remember. But <laughs> if you're interested, I've got the notes, I've got the notes, and I can tell you immediately. Um, but yeah, I think that's it's a really interesting way in which um, they've tried to um, show clusters of activity as well um, on the map in real time, and then you can download the app from there, and it's 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 pretty well thought out thing. Um, then the art project is too bad that Tom left because he's from Google. Does everybody know about the art project? Or? Yeah, yeah, you must. <laughs> you must. It's it's a it's exactly what some one of you said before. It's like Google Maps for. 
uh, Google Street View, but for museums. Mm -hmm. um, and and like, like I browsed through it today. I knew of its existence, and it had been launched on you know all the news channels and so on. And I went and had a look today, and it is truly amazing in terms of the content that's at your fingertips. You know, so I just took the snapshot from the Acropolis Museum. But the one thing that's missing from this is the bloody building of the Acropolis Museum, which is amazing. Um, and, you know, that, that, that starts to kind of show the cracks of, like, yes, I can get the content, yes, I can get the catalog, yes, I can get it, you know, you know geo-reference and reference back to where it sat on the lintel and, you know, where it's traveled since and all that kind of stuff. But in terms of understanding the atmosphere and being at the Acropolis and, and experiencing Athens, it's, it's not really there. By the way, most of this stuff is in London, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, Age-old uh, debate about the of the marbles. Yeah. Uh, Nature Plus. Has anybody heard of um, this? No. Okay, so um, a couple of years back I went to... I'm a bit of a nerd and I really like um, natural history and geology. Okay. <laughs> but um, we're gonna have a nod on geology. Okay, great. Back. <laughs> but um, so I like to go to natural history museums, and I'm very disappointed by the Australian Museum. And I don't know if you know the people from there, but I'd like to have a chat to them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> please, because oh my god. Um, <laughs> ha has anybody been to the, the, the like minerals room where yeah. you can see the glue and you can see the yeah. dust yeah. on the glue? Yes. <laughs> it's so great. It's horrible. Anyway, Nature Plus is completely different. And so the, the Museum of Natural History has gone through a bit of a, um, in South Kensington, has gone through a bit of a rethink and um, probably changed their curator from live first. Um, and what they're thinking about here is they, they've created, they've got the, the 19th, uh, 19th century Victorian building and they've got the dinosaur in the middle and they've got all those galleries and some of them are better than others. There's, there's a lot of 1980s funky stuff going on. But in their new building, the whole concept is around using the museum as the live research lab and so they let you have an insight into what the actual the researchers who work at the, the Museum of Natural History are doing. So you get insights into the you know the woman who looks after butterflies and the woman who looks after you know whatever jaws or I don't know. Um, and, and that's really great because it starts to weave the his you, you start to get to know the person first of all. Um, and then you can weave her story as, a, as, a, as an individual, as somebody who's dedicated their life to butterflies, and you start to understand better what, what she finds so interesting in that. And they've culminated that in a show, I don't know if you've seen it, it was on ABC a while ago, called Museum of Life? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, as part of that, they've developed, and I think, again, it's one of these prototypes, it's, it's maybe not the best way to do it, but it's a way. Um, and it's this little card, it's called Nature Plus, and on the back of it, it's got, um, you pick it up when you enter the museum, and on the back of it, it's got a barcode. And at each station in this new part of the museum, so it doesn't work in the old part of the museum, you scan it in. And you say, oh, like, you know, this, this, this amazing interactive display about different types of butterflies was amazing, and you just scan it in. And so that it's, it's one of those things where you take the experience mm -hmm. home, and then you go home and you type in your barcode, and you say, you know, it was two, 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 blah, 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 and it says, you scanned in these five things, and then it uses a similar search engine to Amazon, and says, people who liked what you liked also liked. <laughs> <laughs> um, so th that, that I thought was really interesting, because it's, it's low-tech in a way. It doesn't rely on augmented reality or an app or anything. You, you know, you could go to a library in theory and... You know, if you didn't have the technology, I mean, you know, in England is a very different place from you know remote and regional Australia. So I understand the limitations in this country, but um, yeah. So I thought that was a really kind of cool with it with a physical artifact that you take away that's branded by the museum and that that helps you remember and recall and prolong the experience of the museum. Uh, <clears throat> this is another one that I think is really great, and one of my colleagues actually. Did this Sarah Barnes and her um, husband, um, who runs Killer Noodle Studios? Um, they, um, she's. It's really interesting in the way that she phrases. She she works with me part time, but she also runs a. Um, I suppose it's an art practice that looks at reinterpreting archival material in situ, and so she used to work at the ABC and she used to work at God knows where everywhere, uh, and she she's seen a lot of archives in her time. 
Um, and she knows that, you know, she'll know exactly, like a librarian, you know, if I say I'm looking for, you know, a 1920s image of Walsh Bay, she'll know where to go. And so she did this, she proposed this for, um, for Art and About um, as a way to actually visualize the past of um, Walsh Bay, in Walsh Bay, projected onto Walsh Bay. Um, and it's a, it's, a real, it's a mediated experience, but it was so well done that you actually felt like you could walk down the street and touch the kids and... And it's just, it's just really fantastic. So I encourage you to go have a look. The website's still up. It was Art and About last year, and she's got another work coming up this year in October. So keep posted. You have to look at that. So the O, has anybody been to Mona? I haven't been, but yep. Yep. So I think it's, it's, I've heard a lot, and it's the rebirth of Hobart. I didn't know it was, you know, anyway. Um, um, and, and, and Mona's done all this stuff, and it's just the rebirth of culture-led regeneration, and and you know it's going to do wonders for everywhere, and we need to have museums everywhere. That's great. Um, but one of the things I, I did a you can't need some money though. It's got to pay. Yeah, tax but yeah, I think David Walsh has got some of that. <laughs> no, no? no the ATO is after him. No, oh, really? Oh, okay, okay. Anyway, I take it back because I don't even know him. But um, <laughs> I, I don't think I should be commenting on his tax situation. <laughs> But um, having said that, um, I just recently did a commission for the State Library of New South Wales. And um, the State Librarian, Alex Byrne, was just mentioning um, that the O had impressed him so much as a, as a way of navigating and making all his content shareable, which I thought was the most important thing for the State Library of New South Wales. I was doing a bit of a strategy piece for them. I'm sure mm -hmm. that's what you do in the house. But... Um, Luckily, you don't work at the New South Wales. Um, <laughs> um, and so he'd gotten the guys who did the O to think about how that might look for the art gallery, uh, for not the art gallery, the State it's Library right. of New South Wales. Um, and I think the concept, and look, I haven't been to Mona, but I think the concept is that they lend you out. So this is one of the things where they give you the technology and then you scan. There's no tags anywhere and then you stag the, you, you, sorry, you, scan the tag and the, like the QR code and then it gives you this kind of information so I mean in principle it's kind of okay but I think in this instance it, unless it's linked to other content or another experience and I don't know the full extent of it but that's all people have relayed to me it feels kind of just gadgety yeah uh, tell us I, inside as you have I actually found it really useful <laughs> yeah? I, I liked being able to choose how much information um, per artwork Okay. That I wanted to consume at the time. That's cool. And then I really loved being able to go back later and it, for it and to tell recorded. me you went to these artworks exactly. and mm -hmm. here are the ones that you missed yep. and you know maybe you went the wrong direction or whatever. And I quite <laughs> <often. laughs> it's sort of GPS, it functions on GPS thing, so it knows yeah. where you are, so you don't actually have to scan through a secret and just go over. Oh, and okay. It'll tell you you're standing in front of this painting. This is, yeah. if you want to, you can. Yeah. yeah. No. And, and, I, I, think and I, saw, I saw grandmothers <laughs> sitting there with the iPod that they had, able to navigate. That's Which great. I, I That's right. Fantastic. You know the great thing about QR codes? Mm -hmm. You can hack them. <laughs> no, no, seriously. So you're in a gallery. No, seriously. Something like that happened to Harvey Norman about four weeks ago, right? No, seriously. Does like, he so, need any more trouble? So you're in a gallery. You're in a gallery. You've got a QR code. The great thing about QR code is it can execute against the device. Ah. In a way that a barcode mm. can't, right? Ah. So you can download malware. But the great thing, so... Harvey Norman, four weeks ago, and you can see that's happening in galleries. So you've got a QR code against an artwork, and the gallery says this is the things that lead to the artwork. You can go in and just with a little sticker that you've printed on your home PC, just stick it over the bar, over the QR code. Yeah, and do anything. Yeah. And yeah. everybody gets the information you want. The <laughs> the there you go. And nobody will notice. And Greenpeace did this to Harvey Norman. Oh. oh. Uh, <laughs> to do with rainforest timbers <laughs> that Harvey Norman was selling. So QR codes yeah. are not your friend. No, unless you're Greenpeace. Probably not. Unless, unless you're a Greenpeace, have you? Case, they're fantastic. Yeah. But I mean, what I think is interesting here, and we probably can finish the presentation and then we'll discuss this, but um, I think what's, what's really interesting here is this idea of keeping a record, a digital record, a digital trace. And I think the interesting thing about that, as much as it's interesting for the user, is also for the curators and so on, and to understand, you know, am I really, instead of using your design toolkit as an adapt, as a predictive thing and say, like, I really think if we put that there and that there, that's going to work. 
um, actually having an evidence-based um, and, a, and a visitation-based way of saying, like, actually, we should try this configuration. It's like kind of like your furniture in your house. You should, you should change it around every so often. Um, so the other thing that I find is really cool in the, in the um, prototype category is this idea of, so has anybody been to Washington, D.C.? Yes. Yeah. How amazing are, the Smiths, are all the Smithsonian museums? They're just bloody amazing. Um, and so the, the idea here is, again, and it's in, in the whole museum space, it's about making your content findable, free, shareable, and vast. And so they're basically trying to create uh, a digital archive of, um, of most of their content. Um, and it's still a prototype, so it's, it's very open. Like, you can go and look at their site, and you can see how they're, they're thinking about the ways in which they're going to do this. Um, but I think that the four principles of findable, free, shareable, and vast are actually really um, bloody important. Okay, so th this is a project that Dan did with Carlo Ratti, which I think is really interesting. We're talking about mediated experiences. Um, and this is something that didn't get built, but how much better would that be than that bloody thing Anish Kapoor built for the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, awful. Yeah, I agree. It's awful. Yeah. There is no way that you can look at that and say that's beautiful. Anyway, so the, <laughs> the idea here is, um, so this is um, Dan and Carlo Ratti. Um, and the idea was actually to use the cloud as a civic scale smart meter for the Olympic Games, and this would be in Stratford, obviously. Um, and the idea would be to be broadcasting different elements because so much is happening during the Olympics and actually broadcast them into the sky and actually make that the kind of thermometer or whatever you want to call it for, for the whole of the Olympic Games. And I thought it was a pretty brilliant vi visualization by, you know, courtesy of Carlo Rossi, thank you very much, in his studio. But um, the idea of doing that um, was, a joint, was a joint endeavor and I quite like that idea. It looks like you can no. climb up into it. Is that... Is that yeah, the idea? idea is that you would do like you would do the... Um, the right tag, yeah. you know, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, in a way, is that also, I mean, given it's kind of the first truly kind of <coughs> social media Olympics, is it kind of meant to kind that of was, engage and reflect that? Yeah, that was the idea. Unfortunately, uh, it was shortlisted. Boris liked it. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Well, Boris likes ping pong <laughs> and cafeteria dinners. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I, I don't know Boris, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> But yeah, no, they they chose a Nishka Kapoor. But also, it's a it's a private installation as well. So that the Anish Kapoor thing Olympics is, is private, isn't it? yeah. But mm. but particularly that thing is not. It's there's very little, very little governance from the actual Olympic Authority. It was very much a privately built, privately funded. But, but do you mean it has to stay there? I'm not sure that it has to stay <laughs> there. <laughs> certainly <laughs> for the most, no, it's <laughs> awful. It anyway. most probably will. It doesn't have to, but it was funded by a steel company, mm. and so they were interested mm. in doing something with steel and mm. some steel work. But wasn't there a, th some issue with that steel company's um, reputation as well as a as a corporate citizen that there was some connection to uh, I don't know I forget the story exactly, but it was not actually this this sort of neutral thing. It was deeply marred. By well, the biggest sponsor of the Olympics is actually BP. So well, okay, well, yeah. Yeah. let's listen. Uh, because I don't think they're any more mad than the rest. Yeah. Um, this is about how bad you yeah. want to get, you yeah. know. It's just, it's just this, shades of this, gray. That work wasn't even shortlisted, so I didn't make the final two. So it no, but it, the initial um, cut. But yeah, no, it wasn't one of the final two, or else I would have heard about it until the cows come home. <laughs> um, the other thing I want to talk about in terms of kind of this idea... So yes, so we've established here that there's a bunch of ideas and, and we've heard Kira's talk and we've heard Siobhan um, talk about innovations in this space. And I, I think what really interested me, I went to TEDx Sydney this year and I'm not like, I'm not a big, not, not that I'm not, not a fan, but uh, you know, I'm neutral about TED. It's, you know, it's not, it's not my lifeblood, but it, I don't hate it either. Um, but the, what I really liked about it is that it showed kind of homegrown ideas. And I think if anything, that's kind of the most, the, the strongest idea about it. And, um, well, we think they should call it TEDx Redfern. Or TEDx Redfern. Yeah. Yeah. But they're changing it. They're sending it to the Opera House next year. Yeah. Uh, maybe you didn't know <laughs> that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Anyway. Um, but the idea is um, that what I, what I thought was really important is that that was all homegrown ideas um, with people who were either from 
here or not, but who actually work and live here. And it was a really a nice way to kind of put your finger on the pulse and get an idea for what cu what the culture and what the ideas brewing locally were. But is there a question then of who's actually curating that and <coughs> who's actually determining what is on the pulse? Because when I looked at this year's kind of list, I kind of went, mm. Well, no, so there's license. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, please. Well, so mm -hmm. it's not curated centrally. Mm. Um, I'm sure Chris Anderson has his fingers in every single pie that's out there. It doesn't seem like he's the <laughs> kind of guy who lets go. Mm. Uh, but he, um, <clears throat> but it's definitely locally um, sourced, and it was very much um, run by Jan Ryan from the ABC this year. Mm. So it's a very local agenda. Now it's the only TEDx I've been to, so that's probably maybe it's a bias. Maybe it was particularly local because of that. But since then, I've had opportunities to. Um, interact with the TEDx Sydney licensee and I think local localism and local flavor is actually really important mm. to the idea of TEDx Sydney at least. I don't know the other t TEDx's. Well, it's oh. a brand. I mean, yeah. they'll, they'll either work or they won't and if mm. you want to do something else you do these things. And mm. um, you, it, if it wasn't interesting to you then mm. they fail. Mm. Mm. So mm. there is nothing inherently great about TEDx. It no, is that's what, what I mean. Is. It is what it mm. is, and if you want to be part of it, mm. have an idea and mm. be part of the idea. I went to the mm. first two and just uh, couldn't get the energy to go to the third. But you know what the thing is about it, and I figured it out while I was sitting there, <laughs> is that it's about sharing an idea. It's not about sharing an experience. It's not mm. about sharing, uh, it, you know, a professional track record, or it's not about that. It's just about saying, hey, I have an idea. How about we do blah, 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 whatever. Somebody had an idea about sh So there's no engagement. Is it? Mm -hmm. No, and then it was a very one one way thing. Mm -hmm. So there, there's yeah. criticisms to be level out at it, but in terms of what I felt is that people there were people from the University of New South Wales, from the people of the University of Sydney. Um, so there's quite a few in UTS. Um, there are people who are working in practices and in agencies locally. And I just thought for somebody who was thinking, you know, just two weeks earlier, when am I moving back to Europe? It was pretty encouraging. So it was pretty good. Um, in that sense. The other one is really this whole idea of Vivid <laughs> Sydney and I was having a chat with somebody recently and then that again is just this whole event space, you know, it's just like the mega event. But it, for what it is, um, the idea that, you know, you can encourage people to produce interactive art. And the first slide that I had there was Screaming Rapture, which was done by members of my team and the Social Fireflies were as well. Um, the whole idea of actually experiencing the vibe of a culture through, you know, interactive art, I think it, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Um, you know, again, it is what it is, and it is sponsored by the people that it's sponsored, but oh well. Um, but I don't think anything takes away from place. I don't think, you know, and I, and I love this other stuff, and I'm the first one to push it mm. to everybody, but I don't think people will stop going to Paris. No. Mm. No, I don't think people will stop wanting to experience an amazing place like Walsh Bay. I mean, it's a bit dead, but it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it is. No, but you know what I mean? It's a, because what you're looking for, the ultimate, your goal is very different. When you're interacting through a mediated experience uh, or an augmented experience, um, it, your, your experience is very segmented and there's, an, there's a limit to that. So mm. if I'm looking at the Phantom City, it's amazing, but it's actually relying on that database and nothing else, right? If I'm looking at you know, whatever app I have on my phone, the Powerhouse Museum one or whatever, it, it, that's the database that I'm tapping into and, and, and that's it. Whereas if I'm walking through the streets of Paris and I'm actually picking up on much more than that, and I don't think, or if I'm walking through the streets of Athens and if I'm experiencing Metropolis for the first time, it's much more than that. Um, it's not to say that we should take, it's not worthwhile kind of introducing kids. Mm -hmm. Like I remember going to museums or doing stuff like you're doing with kids and it's changed my life. You know, it's super important. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm saying that place still matters. And so definitely you land somewhere rather than everywhere. Um, and one of the people I think does this the best is one of my former classmates at Columbia, this woman called um, Candy Chain. Has anybody heard of Candy Chain? Yeah. She's really, uh, you should meet her as well when you go overseas. She's, um, she's one of those, she really wants to be low tech. Um, she's a she's with the stickers. Yeah, yeah. I've yeah. I've killed it! <laughs> Damn it! Oh, no! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so she goes low tech and I think in terms of experiencing culture, I think how cool is it to have a massive 
Uh, she's got this massive chalkboard. She she just gets black chalkboard paint out, and then she stencils in before I die. I want to, and then and this was actually this particular one was in a is was in the ninth ward in um, New Orleans, and she got people to you know pe- there was there's just like a bucket of chalk. Um, and people just go and say, before I die, I want to write a novel, uh, to be one that she believes, to be published, um, to live with something or other, to live the best life. And what a fantastic way, really, to tap into a community experience um, there. And so this one is the one that I think is really cool, which is the real estate revealed one. She got a, and, and this is when a post-it can be much better than any screen, than any projection, than anything. She just got these post-its uh, made, um, customized, and it says, I've lived in, and then it says, a X bedroom apartment in blank for blank, and I pay blank. <laughs> right? <laughs> and you can go on her website, and she's actually collated the data. So she made this. This doesn't show it, but it's actually in a quite nice formation on a shop window in, in Carroll Gardens in Brooklyn. And then you can see the disparity in rents that people pay. And it's actually quite interesting in terms of how that, that um, neighborhood is transforming itself, actually. Um, and that's, that's, I think, you know, that's kind of the most, some of the most powerful work I've seen is hers. And, she's in, she, and she's, she would be so easy to get down here, actually, because she's so keen to come and have a look. And she went to South Africa with my partner and I a few years ago, and, and she'd be really great to have around. And that's it. Thank you very much. I have a question. Yes. With those last, um, that, that last slide with the, the stickers, you know, whenever I think of urban informatics, I, I somehow always naturally seem to think, I'm surprised I'm alone in this, of you know, a technically mediated experience. But that to me is about urban data. Yeah. And it's just a different way of surfacing it and representing it to exactly. uh, a interface. Yeah. Um, so, you know, are we, are we thinking too narrowly when we think about um, technology in place, you know. Well, is that, I don't think technology is the word you should use. Mm. What's, that, what's the word? I, because technology is just the it's just the enabler. It's just you know, um, a wheel. It's technology. So, we, are we talking yeah. about um, different tr- different kind of truth telling? We're just talking about making visible the invisible. Mm-hmm. That's what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. So it's, just, that, it's, yeah. isn't it? it's media. They're all, it's all forms of media. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You sometimes find the technology is the inhibitor rather than the facilitator because if you look at, I mean, <coughs> if, you if you first get public transport every day, I find it horrendous. You get the thing, and this technology is actually inhibited. Not only are we going to the same train? Place. Because I see no technology whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean the train here? Look at the screens we're the, on the bus. I'm not talking about big screens. I'm talking stuff that people carry with them. Oh, no sorry. one actually looks at the place that they're travelling through. Mm-hmm. No one talks to each other. They sit and look at their iPhone with their earphones in, and they're all sitting in isolation of each other and place. And so I look at that and I think, gee, this technology is a real inhibitor of social interaction. But they use the newspapers. <laughs> yes, I'm going to use that again. Never, never make eye contact on public transport. It's, it's rude. <laughs> what are you going to do? Start, I, I always start talking to people, but that's kind of weird, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that, there was a great project by Martin Tomatich, I'm not sure. Tomatich. 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 Um, where they put big chalkboards out the front of a bunch of terrace houses all in a row, mm. and they wrote down the... Yesterday's usage of water and yesterday's energy. usage of energy. energy and usage, yeah. yeah, and that was a big change for that community. Is and that just done here in Darlington? It was done, yeah. yeah, just done here in Darlington. So I've done a little bit of work <laughs> with him on urban screens. So I taught a, I got a bit bored at SBS and asked if I could have half a day off a week, and they let me. Mm-hmm. So I took that half a day and I spent it teaching kids about urban screens. So we did an urban screen project, and we were doing a bunch of stuff around. The fact that you could, with a uh, connect, uh, a cheap laptop processing and a screen, and a pr- like a cheap ass projector and like a bit of film, you could tell stories on buildings. So I was kind of trying to do that. And then I heard about his project because I was working with him. He never mentioned it, someone else mentioned it. I'm like, it is so much better and it's chalk. You said. T- one thing that really struck with me, I think this is really important, and I, I, which is the temporal aspect of place. And you're talking about Bay, for example. Mm. And there are two things about the temporal experience of place. And one is, uh, I think for people who are doing digital things, this is really important. But one is, of course, when you're in a place like Paris, there's the temporal thing of 
the history of the place and Walsh Bay, which Alice tells that as well. There's also the experience that you're actually having, which is, I think, what you were getting to. Mm. And that's different than the one-time kind of or the immediate presentation of the digital experience that we want to give people in that place. Mm. And those experiences, I, I quite, don't quite know how to put the, the three things together because the, the experience you're having mm -hmm. is different than the experience of the place. Mm -hmm. which is different than the experience of the presentation. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of interested in your thoughts about that. Um, I think it's slightly, I think I understand what you're saying, but I, <clears throat> what, I'm, I, what I was trying to say with this whole um, idea like that you can't ex experience culture through only through di digital media, not that I'm suggesting that we do that, but um, is that place offers so many more variables of interaction you know what about the people what about the people laughing down the road what about the dog barking what about the glass that broke what about the, the ambulance going by um you, you, you there there's no way to really recreate that sense and therefore the what it will mean to you you know and that's your experience of the time of the time exactly as opposed to the time that it was exactly yeah, yeah. But isn't there another dimension to it's it very this has become yeah. very very highbrow, so better be a good well, question. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, okay. Um, right. Uh, but I want to go back to something you said earlier on about, um, I think it was New Yorkers you were talking about, or Americans more generally, that, that um, you know, with such a, a kind of a low level of service that they are quite motivated to create things and to engage in a, in, with the civic apparatus in whatever way, and that that might be a digitally mediated thing. So is there another aspect to the, when we think about digital in place, that there's more about the civic engagement and engagement with community and, and, and creating a sense of community through those sorts of, I guess, um, channels and rather yeah. than it, it being an augmentation of place or a way to, to take in and consume place. It's a way of actually exercising control or, or, um, I, or I think that's really voicing interesting. In and the, place. the person that Siobhan and I really want to somehow get down here, um, Jake Barton, who mm. runs um, Local Projects. Um, it's a company called Local Projects. Um, he, he and his team have put together this quite cool um, interface, which is also post-its, but they're digital post-its, called uh, Change By Us, and it was actually endorsed by the mayor of New York and Memphis and Chicago and whatever, and it was about asking... It's about four cities, isn't it? Four yeah, I don't know what the other one was, I can't remember. Um, but the idea was to ask specific questions to the public and then have people you know, post their ideas. So th there's a few things about that. I think that's about mass insight, mm. right? And that's not about, you know, you have no guarantee that your suggestion is going to make it, you know. But it's about mass insight and it's about collecting data on a specific issue that you'd never be able to co collect in other circumstances. However, you're dealing with a self-selected sample. So, <laughs> you know, the statistics of it don't really show you what people do. Yeah, people who are willing to participate in your thing thought X, Y, and Z, which is a very different thing than, you know, 50% of the population think that you should not do this or do it, you know. Um, so I think that's what they're trying to get to, and like I work, I work a lot in the um, local government transformation of local government um, in, in terms of what they can do and how digital can help the way that they work. Um, and um, they're, you know, it's very hard for them to. They would like to be able to tap into that. They'd like to be able to walk away from the community consultation model, which is so boring. Hmm. Well, again, also so narrow. As again, well, and it's narrow, and the same old people who you know yeah. turn up to those meetings. And they're, you know, sometimes they're paid, and sometimes they're not paid, and you know. Anyway, it's it's just what it is, but it it, it, it it's so imperfect in the way that that it's done. Um, the opportunity of gaining mass insight through some of these interfaces is is really huge, you know. And if it's fun, and if it's not too taxing, and if you feel like you're contributing, you can start seeing actually the feedback. If you can start seeing that some of the stuff is happening, then you're more likely to be involved. Um, so definitely, that's another that's another application. Was that a good question? That was okay. Yeah. You're <laughs> 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 on that. Who ultimately then decides about place? You know, if we're starting to use more and more of these kinds of tools or um, applications to kind of engage with communities. Is it ultimately the community that's deciding? Is it the person who's kind of, in a way, curating that kind of engagement? Is it government? Who's actually in charge? I think they will ignore all inconvenient evidence. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Just being a realist, um, 
I, I think it's a great PR tool sometimes. And I, I wish, you know, people could, you know, design by consensus and, 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 and find a way of synthesizing mass insight into something that's not just a survey. Um, and that kind of reflects the qualitative and the variation in the in the responses. Mm. Uh, but I think, yeah, I think if it stands to promote your idea, then that's great. If it doesn't, then ignore it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm putting myself in the in the position of like a counselor, or whatever, trying to get something through. You know. Isn't isn't the solution to that problem rather than in like uh, social input, etc., um, just algorithms which automatically collect that data? And and isn't affirming these kind of models uh, eroding the capacity to have a choice on to whether or not you want to be included in these kind of models? So you're you saying can can algorithms make these decision for mm -hmm. decisions for us? I mean, it seems like a lot of the conversations revolve around um, decisions by consumers or citizens. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, a fair way to describe them in terms of the models that we've been talking about is consumers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, making the choice to be included in a variety of data sets which will ultimately be used to make decisions about what's best for them. Mm -hmm. Why not cut out the um, part where people are deciding to input their um, uh, opinion mm -hmm. and just collect the data? Yeah. I ask this in a pessimistic way, no, no, of course. Yeah. Like it's not necessarily <laughs> pessimistic. It's fully intense. <laughs> <laughs> so we we used to a museum and we don't know how it's going to be used. So because no one's ever been in it before, like all the spaces are different. Even the existing space is refurbed and we've moved walls and we've added floors and we've double space, double height space and we've made new joints. We've stuck a whole building onto it. So. We want to roll out Wi-Fi. I argued that it should be free. I argued that I won. I argued with the people who made the Wi-Fi that they should give me the keys to the engine. Another argument that I won. Then I went and paid someone a very small amount of money and they built a tracking engine. So I know what room you're in. And I use that information to tell you what works are in that room. So you can either choose to put in the number of the work or you can type or you can just hit around me because it'll tell you what works around me. But that means that I know what room people are in. When, when you say into, you mean phones? In their phones, mm -hmm. yeah. So anyone who's got a smartphone, which is what fifty percent of Australians now, yeah. um, who Actually. has Wi, yeah, who has Wi-Fi on. Then what about I the population that goes to visit you? It'd be higher. Sixty-three percent. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I made that up. No. <laughs> <laughs> but it is more I'm sure it's higher. I'm so sure yeah, it's higher. Sure but so what we use that. We look at that and we try to help ourselves make better flow mechanisms for a building that has never been walked in before. And so that's exactly what you're talking about. And we are like very late to this party. There are people a decade ahead of us in terms of doing that, in terms of making choices. But most of those choices are about how high things are, should, should be in a supermarket and how much you should pay to have your product at a particular height, at ends of shelves, stuff like that. They're, the supermarket chains are ahead of everyone else here. Yeah. I think there's also this share is, this trading. Is actually, this is actually what I do for a living. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I'm presuming you're using the Cisco MSC or something like that. And no, we ran our own thing on the back of a room. Okay, anyway, anyway the, 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 the thing is there that there's a difference between data, using data to measure what people do and data to make decisions about what people do. Mm. Mm. And I think it's a really, really crucial thing. And mm. part of that is that, as anybody who's studied the history of political movements know, is that when people act on things, they don't do it in a linear kind of fashion. There is the notion of kind of like the, the critical mass or the tipping point or whatever it is where, where you can have a lot of data mm. in a certain direction and it doesn't actually mean anything. And then all of a sudden there is a, like a, 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 a thing that is not in the algorithm, mm. the Che Guevara or whatever, that makes things work differently. And because I work in this, I, I do a lot of big, what I call big data work, and I do a lot of tracking of people in real world environments and things like that. Um, one of the phobias I have is, you know, what we're going to do with all this sort of stuff. And you can't use this to make decisions about what people want. You can make decisions about what people do. Mm -hmm. That's all you can measure. What people want is, again, I'm. Sorry, I'm talking a lot tonight. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. But, but, um, but actually, I'm wondering, sorry, I'm wondering, Nick Abbott, you work in, in mobile. I mean, what comes to mind for you around some of these sorts of things, tracking people and what happens with that data? Uh, I think that, well, personally, I don't think 
you know, I don't like to track it. I like to use it, you know, like you said, to you know, understand what people are doing, not what they, you know, what they, what they want. It's, uh, I think that it's, it's very early days in a lot of it to under, to try and get an understanding of how to use it. I think we can record it, we can keep a hold of it, track it, but you know, I wouldn't want to guess where it's going to, you know, understand what people are trying to do. But we still mm. use it to make decisions. Mm. Yeah, we do, but I don't want. You know, Coles or Woolworths to know what I'm going to buy when I walk into the store. Uh, uh, I'm happy to you know, use it when I'm walking around a gallery. <laughs> 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 don't get flybys. <laughs> <laughs>